Hi everyone, this week we're going to be taking a look at my Commodore 64 again, but first, this video is sponsored by PCBWay. They sent over this mini oscilloscope for me to check out. I have no idea how to use it, but we'll figure it out later in the video. With over a decade in business, PCBWay is a leader in the manufacturing of PCBs. They also offer 3D printing, custom PCBs, CNC machining, and low prices with a quick turnaround and on-time delivery rate of 99%. Visit PCBWay.com for all of your PCB needs. Or if you just want to take the hassle out of 3D printing, I have a 3D printer myself, but of course it was down for months just due to small issues and frustration. If you don't want to deal with this, contact PCBWay and they'll get your parts printed for you. So we'll just take a quick look at the oscilloscope. Pretty cool. It is run on battery, charged by USB, um, very small, comes with two probes, for you to, you know, do what oscilloscopes do. We'll check it out later on in the video. Um, but what we're going to be working on today is my Commodore 64. Currently there's no sound. So what I'm going to do is take a look at the cord and just see if there's any issues. I did pull up the diagram online and see there are four outputs. It looks like I only really need two, one for video and one for audio because it is a mono signal and I don't have a monitor that supports dual video signals. So we'll go ahead and check this out, and it looks like one of the wires is not making contact. Of course, the one that I need is not making contact. So the first thing I'm gonna do is take out a multimeter, check each wire against the pins in the connector, and I'll label them as follows. We'll see which ones are working, which ones are not, and unfortunately, we're gonna have to cut this open. It looks like we found our faulty connector. This one is not going to anything, so it must be broken inside. At the time I thought I would be able to just slip out the metal piece and reconnect it, but it doesn't work out so well, kind of like everything that I do. It's gonna take a little bit more effort than it's worth. I could have just bought a new cable, but for proof of concept, I just figured why not try to fix this one? It's free, solder doesn't really cost anything if you already have it, so let's get to work. I tried using rubbing alcohol and tweezers to free the connector from the cable. Um, if it's your own custom made, you can typically slot these off and either connect or disconnect wires and then put it back together. As we'll find out later on, this is just one big piece of rubber. It was manufactured this way and really wasn't meant to be taken apart. So I'm going to kind of destroy it, but it's for a good cause. And here's where we resort to violence, get out the pliers, and just rip that plug out of there, because who cares at this point? So I'm just going to remove the shielding around the wires and then get the ground wire that's kind of intertwined around all of them separated. And then we'll remove a little bit of the shielding from each wire and get them pre-tinned and ready to be soldered onto the connector. The ground wire is going to end up being too thick, 
but we'll cut that down later as it only needs to connect to one point. So what I'm doing here is just removing any remaining pieces of wire or material that are left in the connector. Basically just getting the solder flowing and then anything that's stuck to it I'm just going to take off so that I have a nice clean spot to solder to. And then we'll remove any flux that's left over on it as it does make quite a mess. Then we'll go ahead and get the wires soldered on one by one. Uh, I am looking at the pinout on the computer. Um, we'll, we'll see later how well that works out, but you know, it's there for reference. So here's the ground wire. I cut it down to about a quarter of its size just so it was able to solder to one pin and not bridge against the others. It should still carry everything just fine and the wires are shielded most of the way. That's why it's intertwined around them so that you don't get interference. Ideally it would be wrapped around them all the way to the end but not quite as easy done as it is said. With the connector being one big rubber part, I ended up just drilling out both sides. A big drill to get where the metal goes in, and then just a small drill to poke the wires through. Um, and then the actual cord itself can sit in the remaining portion of the connector. And I'm just going to go ahead and put some shrink wrap over before I put the connector on. I should have bought a bigger one for the end, but this is all that I had on hand, so I can only do half of the connector. The rest I'm just going to wrap in electrical tape so it stays in one piece. Now that we have that wrapped up, time to test. Um, I did figure out after that I had them labeled wrong, so let's listen to some Commodore sound. Another visitor. Stay a while. Stay forever. Destroy him, my robot. So we were able to see on the oscilloscope the sound wave acting normal when it was just music playing and then when I failed miserably at the game you can see the sound waves just blow up. So if nothing else you can test sound with the oscilloscope. Were this not working, um, if it was an actual issue inside the Commodore 64, we'd be taking these little tiny probes that you can see here and checking the SID chip to see if it's functioning. Um, great video on the 8-bit guy on how to actually fix the Commodore 64 itself if it's not outputting sound. So let's take a look at this oscilloscope from PCBWay 
it does come with the two probes and you can set the attenuation to one or 10 X. Um, it does come with these little clips that I wish I had found earlier when I was trying to connect to the cords. Definitely should have looked through the box before I just use the little hook on the end of the connector. It also comes with what looks like spare parts and then just a fold out manual to get you started. I ended up just turning it on, playing around with it. Um, there's two knobs that you can use on the top. One controls which item on the screen you're looking at, and the other adjusts that particular item. You can see that it's blinking right now, so it's selected that. Um, we'll just go ahead and have a quick little look around it. I still have some learning to do with it, of course, but for now, it's definitely fun to play with. It's charged by micro USB, and you can see that one knob controls which item you're going to be changing and the other knob changes the item that you've selected. This is a four channel analog and digital. Um, seems to hold the charge pretty well. I charged it once and I was playing around with it for quite a long time and the battery didn't die so it shouldn't have any issues there. With its compact size, I'll probably end up buying a little rubberized case for it just because things get beat up over the years of being used. Uh, you can see here we can go ahead and disable channels. So if you're not using four channels, it's pretty easy to just turn them off. And then the play pause button is what starts recording the information that you want recorded. Um, pretty simple, pretty easy to use. And thank you again to PCBWay for sponsoring this video and sending this over. I'll definitely be using it more in the future. Thanks for watching.